All right, let's do this. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala ahlihi wa sahbihi. Wa man tabi'ahum bihsanin ila abdeen. I don't know if it's me, Sister Dora, but I hear a little bit of a... <clears throat> like I can hear myself. An echo? Really? Yeah. yeah. Do you guys feel that too? <clears throat> if somebody can comment in the chat. Can you guys hear... See? I hear a little bit of a feedback. If you maybe move away from the wall a bit, maybe it might help. Or you might have to put your volume down, yeah. Just for the... I, I tried that, yeah. Is it better now? Uh, testing. I still hear it a little bit. So see if you can move up from the wall. Maybe the voice is rebounding from the wall. Just come maybe up just a little bit. Sorry, you guys. Technical difficulties. Just... Okay, so testing, hello, testing. Can you still, is the echo still there, y'all? A little bit? Seems a little bit better. Okay, I think we can live with this. All right, let's do this. So, uh, I'm sorry. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Wa ala ahlihi wa sahbihi. Wa man tabi'ahum bihsanin ila yumideen. You guys, today, our guest for Sinafix is none other than a Salam schooler. And not just any Islam schooler, dare I say, one of my favorite Islam schoolers. Um, you can blush now. I was kidding. <laughs> uh, some of you may not know, but I actually teach Islam school, Islam high school to be specific, which is, uh, which is why I'm aging so fast. And um, uh, there's something remarkable happening at Islam school where what I call a core effect is occurring, where committed students, cream of the crop, are rising on the top particularly in Islamic studies. And it's really, really wholesome. It's really beautiful to see. And Dora, when I look at you, to me, you represent that badge, those elite students. And you know, even, it's not just you, it's also like your family. Like I've had the honor of teaching you, teaching Jannah through Core Academy, and I've had the dishonor of teaching Hisham. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I love Hisham. Kari Naman stole him from me. Uh, I miss him. And uh, inshallah, inshallah, it'll be, I'll probably see him at some point. And, um, you know, my Lord, I reward you for your energy, positivity, and above all, your passion. Your passion is contagious. Don't change. Keep up the good work. May Allah keep, always keep your heart pulsating with passion. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Good vibes, mashallah. Welcome aboard. Thank you. I'm glad to be aboard. I mean, ahlan, ahlan. So, uh, Sister Dua, what we're going to do, inshallah, today is Hadith 236 under the chapter Kitabul Ma'roof. This is Imam Bukhari's 11th chapter. And Ma'roof, if y'all remember, means noble deeds, widely appreciated deeds, deeds that Allah appreciates and rewards you for. That's what Ma'roof is. So today we're starting the second last hadith under this chapter, where Imam Bukhari brings a hadith, and the hadith begins like this. Abu Salama, a famous scholar of Medina, and he's one of the top scholars from the first century. Abu Salama, radiallahu anh, begins the hadith by telling us that I paid my teacher, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, a visit. I paid my teacher, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, his sheikh, a visit. And here he says something really beautiful. He says, and he was like a friend to me. What does he say? He's a great companion of the Prophet, super religious, mashallah, super pious. But he's like, the way he would treat me and the way he has always interacted with me, he was like a buddy to me. And to me, here lies the first lesson that if you are a mentor, if you are a teacher or an older sibling, then, and, and if you especially happen to be a bit more religious than other people, then it's an important lesson that you don't become preachy all the time. That you're not always hampering people with religion. You don't always have your haram gun out shooting people down. Like, you know, you don't have to turn every conversation a religious conversation. Like you'll be talking about, so you, you, people will be having a chill conversation. You're talking about, I don't know, the Avengers, the end game and the brothers like, but the true end game is Jannah and Jahan number. It's like, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. You don't have to turn everything into a religious conversation. Honestly, honestly, go ahead, every, Sister Dora. Yes. Honestly, every single um, 
Muslim hits that stage. Like I remember I hit that stage where I felt like, oh, I'm not being that good of a Muslim. And so I used to go everywhere just saying, like when my friends used to mention, you know, oh, hey, this test was really easy. Like, alhamdulillah, it was, until Allah, we have to make dua. Like it was, it was like continuous all the time. My friends were like, dua, just loosen up sometimes. Like our deen is a part of us, but we also have to remember that like, wow. you know, yeah, our lives are our lives, like Dean is supposed to help us live our lives to the best. It's not supposed to overtake our lives. So every single aspect is like, our Dean, our Dean, our Dean, I can't, you know, go to sleep because what if I fall asleep and, and then don't pray like midnight and then I forget to pray Fajr. Yeah. You, you know, it's, it's, first of all, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. You know, Dean, a lot of times is something that is internal. Taqwa, yeah, you, you, you are, you know, Islam is a lifestyle and it's always with you. But at times, it's inside of you, and it doesn't always have to be at full display. Not everything just ha has to become an overt religion expression, religious expression. We know that guy exists that wants to turn everything into a hereafter conversation. But, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Anas Radiallahu Anh, tells us something beautiful. He says, sometimes we would be hanging out with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we would be talking about food, and the Prophet would talk about food. We're talking about worldly affairs, He's talking about worldly affairs. He's human, what? He didn't always listen to him. He said he didn't always pester us with religious knowledge and shove it down our throats. So, something so important. Like I've, I've, I've been in a situation where there's a wedding going. You can barely hear someone and everybody's chilling and having like a lighthearted conversation and somebody's just forcing it in there. Some heavy religious concept, like there's a time and a place. There's a time and a place. So that's the first thing, first lesson I wanted to highlight that Abu Sa'id is so chill, despite being a companion of the Prophet, so non preachy that his buddy, uh, his student, Abu Salama, feels like, yo, he was like a friend to me. We were tight. And uh, another lesson before we move forward, Sister Dua, is that isn't it such an art and a skill that you can be chill with your teacher and yet yeah. still not cross certain lines? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Isn't that a skill? Like, I, I'm always blown away by those individuals. Like I have some people in my core leadership, like Sister Sana Hanan and Bilal Rao, mashallah. Like, you know, they'll take liberties with you. You know, they'll, they'll poke you, but well within bounds of respect. And that's such a, it's something, it's like an art that you learn. Because look, let, let me just, I mean, let me, let's, let's say the way it is. As a teacher, you always have an advantage in the troll game. You know, that's just one of the few perks of being a teacher. You would know. You know, and uh, you can't always be trying to get even and clap back and whatever. You know, you just got to take it at times. You know, you got to swallow it. Like my teacher, Sheikh Abdul Nasser, man, he is a master at trolling. <laughs> Notice I didn't say he's a troll because that would be disrespectful. But I said he's a master. He has that skill. And I've been a victim plenty of times. But what do you do? You take it. In fact, you learn. You observe. So then you can, you know, pass it on to your students. Because yeah. in Islam, honestly, like Islam teaches us boundaries, but it doesn't, there's a difference between knowing like our boundaries and then, you know, trying to like stay away, like create your own boundaries, right? Mm. So like, yes, a teacher, there's a natural boundary there. Like you're my teacher, I'm your student. I can't start like, you know, acting like you're my chum. But still, if you want to create a bond, which is something that Islam like, you know, encourages creating bonds with, you know, our relatives, bonds with our friends, bonds with the people that like these random people that we meet. And so like, we have to understand what the boundaries are, but don't yes. start creating your own boundaries. Yes. So that'll make you isolated. And yeah. You that's amazing. Barakallah. Like, yeah, you, like, imagine you're hanging out with your teacher. Let me, let me whoop you in chest. Like, you can't use that kind of language. Like, you know, you've got to be, there's, there's a certain decorum that you always want to be observant of. Mashallah, I feel like you do such a good job, Sister Dua. May Allah reward you. Keep up the good work, despite the fact that I've uh, targeted you various times. But alhamdulillah, you're a good sport. So, anywho, so hadith goes on, where uh, Abu Salama says, I decided to pay my teacher a visit. And um, he was like a friend to me. And then what happened is that he's like, when I approached him, I asked him, why don't we go out to the palm fields where the palm trees are and let's talk business. That's basically what he said to me. He approached him and he's like, let's go out to the palm trees. They're probably business partners, it seems. So he's like, let's go out to the palm trees. Let's see how the operation's going. And Abu Sarid, this teacher is like, bet, let's go. And uh, now here's a crazy part. This is where the hadith ends. So, uh, let me just give a little bit of a background, and then I want to ask a million-dollar question. If someone answers, we should throw out a merch. Dua, you can't answer because I feel like I already gave you the answer when we were chatting offline. 
but I have no recollection of that. Yeah. So so check this out. You guys, this is a farming society. Just keep it in mind. This is a farming society and palm field the fields of palm trees, that's like your factory. That's your office building, if you will. This is where the money making happens. So Abu Salama and Abu Sarid, his teacher, they probably work together. They pro pro probably have some partnership. He's like, he comes to his teacher. He's like, yo, let's talk business. Let's go out to the palm tree. Let's see what's happening. Let's see the operation. Imam Bukhari ends the hadith right here when Abu Sarid is like, let's go. So he takes his shawl and they're out and they go to the fields. We know, Sister Dua, this is a much longer hadith. We know this from other books of hadith. Yet Imam Bukhari somehow, for some reason, cuts off the hadith right here. The question is, the million dollar question is, why? What's the lesson he's trying to get across? I'm going to give you guys a big hint. If you figure this out, definitely sending you some free, fresh merch that we just printed out that Mashallah Safiya won, won last time. The focus on the chapter heading, which is Kitab al -Ma'ruf. And now, let me read the hadith to you one last time. Abu Salama pays Abu Sa'id a visit. And he's like, he was a friend to me. And I went up to him and I said, Let, can you come with me? Why don't we go out to the field of the palm trees? Abu Sa'id is like, let's go. He takes his shawl and he goes with him. That's the end of the hadith. Literally. Imam Bukhari just cuts it off right here, even though it's a much longer hadith, because he's trying to get across a point. I want somebody to pick up, to pick up that point. What is he trying to get across? Sister Dora, you're the lifeline. If they can't figure it out, you'll take a crack at it. If you can, otherwise I will give the answer. So you guys, what is the lesson here that they're trying to get across? Free merch. I, let me see if I have the picture up of the merch. If I do, I'll put it up just to entice people further. Um, but yeah, what's the lesson that Imam Bukhari is trying to get across? Oh, here's a little merch for y'all. Yeah. What is the lesson here, you guys? Obviously, it's a hard question. We ain't giving, giving away no free merch. We got to really connect the dots on this one. It's Kitab al-Ma'ruf. That's a big hint. And one of the last hadith in this book is this one, where the hadith cuts off uh, both of them going out to the palm field, and then that's over. So what's the lesson here? Okay, I think it's safe for us to say, Sister Dora, you might have to help them. What do you think? I think that Islam is uh, the reason that it's cut off there is because he's emphasizing like Islam's outlook on working. Ah, very yeah. good. Islam's outlook on making a living. In other words, mm -hmm. what's the name of the chapter? Kitab al Ma'ruf. And Ma'ruf are noble deeds, things Allah rewards you for, Allah appreciates. As if Imam Bukhari is saying, part of what Allah finds noble, part of what Allah rewards you for, is you making a living. You making money. In fact, making money is a rewarded enterprise by Allah. That's the incredible lesson that is being put across here, y'all. And I, I want you guys to just try to wrap your head around that. SubhanAllah. That, and so the main thing that I want to emphasize here is that Abu Sa'id is super religious. Yet his student has no problem, no qualms coming up to him. He's like, yo, let's talk business. Let's go to the office. Let's see what's going on onto the field because making money is something that the Sahaba don't look down upon. And you guys, here's the last lesson that I want to highlight. And then when inshallah, we're done. You guys, Islam, in Islam, money and making money is actually an act of worship that Allah rewards you for. That's the beauty of our deen. Like, we don't take a negative stance towards money. Money is bad and money sucks. It's all dunya and all that stuff. We have a very nuanced, very positive approach to money. I'm not saying this to sound forward thinking and enlightened, Sister Dua. I say this because you know how, how Allah refers to money in the Quran? You'll be shocked. One of the names of mal, money in the Quran is khair. You know how we say, Jazakallahu khairan, may Allah grant you goodness. Uh, inshallah khairan, you know, inshallah good happens. One of the names of money in the Quran is wa innahu li hubbil khairi la shadeen. Money is called khair, goodness. Why? Because it has such potential for goodness, it is called goodness. Think about that for a second. Like, I am, like, this tells you money is not inherently evil in our deen from the perspective of our deen. And then, even crazier, making money, Allah causes yabtaguna min fadlillah. Seeking Allah's bounty and blessing 
when you're employed out and about making money, Allah is like they're seeking Allah's blessings and bounty. It, like you know, like Surah Al Jum'ah, this comes up where Allah is teaching us the etiquettes of the Jum'ah prayer. Like, what are you supposed to do when Jum'ah dawn goes off? You should, you're supposed to just put everything away and go and attend the Jum'ah prayer. Okay, the last ayah of the surah, Allah says, "Faida kuliyat is salah." When the prayer is done. Prayers over. What are you supposed to do? Allah says, "Fun tashiru fil ard." Now go spread into the land. Why, Allah? Why are we supposed to spread into the land so we can go to the wilderness and meditate on God's signs? La, 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 la. Allah says, "Wa b'tahu min fadlillah." Now that you're done with prayer, go make money, go make a living, stand on your own financial feet. Like Allah is literally commanding you, go back to work. When you're done with Jummah prayer, don't be hanging around like these coddled millennials living off their parents' basement till the age of thirty. You gotta mm -hmm. go ahead. That's ironic. Okay, uh, there are those people that like, oh no, we know the power of money. Money can, you know, trigger our desires. Money can corrupt people, so uh -huh. I'd rather live impoverished. And in my head, I'm thinking. Aren't you kind of doubting your your like your the strength of your own iman, the strength that like I can have money, alhamdulillah, and I can you know what is called work for a living, and I can get everything that I need, right? But I still can keep my faith. I can still yeah. stay strong in the things that I do. You know? It's like a it's like a knife, right? You you can use it as a cooking tool or a weapon. You have to decide based on your approach. Here's something so powerful. When I read this, like this was this floored me. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah is describing the ritual of Hajj. Hajj, once in a lifetime journey that you're going to go meet God. You know, you're retracing the footsteps of Ibrahim. You think God would demand iron focus. As Allah is describing the steps of Hajj and the ritual of Hajj and the etiquettes of Ihram. In the middle, right there, Allah says, لَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَبْتَهُ فَضْلًا مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ There's no blame upon you if you're making money on the side. In the, Imam, uh, Imam Qurtubi, the famous Mufassir, he comments on this. He's like, Allah says here, the literal translation is, there's no blame upon you if you're seeking God's bounty. That's the actual phrase, the same phrase I said earlier. He's like, this phrase always comes in the Quran for tijara and trade and making money. He's like, in this ayah is the permissibility that if you are on Hajj and you are a Haji, it's still okay for you to have a side gig because Allah doesn't want you ending up on the road. If you need to sustain yourself because you are there for a couple of days, it's okay to make money on the side. And you know what's even more beautiful hearing that? It's Allah's understanding of human. Uh, ah, of, yes. As, as a person. Allah knows that at a certain point, no matter what, you can be the most, you know, uh, what is it called? Like, you're so pious and like, there's no one more religious than you. But still, there's, you're going to be slightly motivated by money. Yes. Slightly, even the slightest bit. And so Allah knows that like, no matter what, money is going to be a part of our lives. It's a part of, you know, our intentions. And so, you know what, I'm not going to shun money because that will shun people from like, you know, mm. considering the fact that Islam is, you know, Islam is generous. Islam is merciful. Yes. So it, as, that really hits hard. That, that, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Like the, the humanity and practicality of the deen is at like full display here. And you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say that a person who's toiling to earn money for his family, his parents, his kids, himself even. He says that person, when he's out and about making money, he is actually out fi sabilillah. He's on the path of God. Hadith comes in, you're getting rewarded. And then the Prophet says, when you spend money on your family with the right intention, Allah counts it as charity. So earning money and spending money, the entire enterprise is rewarded. <laughs> it's amazing. Alhamdulillah. Like, and you know, Umar bin Khattab was super particular on this. When he was a Khalifa, he would show up to the masjid. And if it's not Dhuhr time yet, there's still an hour or two. And if he'd see grown men hanging around doing nothing, just sitting there and they're like somehow supposedly doing tasbih and stuff, you get upset. And he's like, why are you here right now? Aren't, shouldn't you be out there making a, a use of yourself, doing something productive, being a contributing member of society? Why are you here right now? It's time for prayer. Go make a living. You know darn well Allah does not rain down gold and silver from the sky. Go make a living for your family. This is Umar bin Khattab. And then the same Umar bin Khattab used to say, so like, such a beautiful quote. He used to say, sometimes I look at someone and that person strikes me as very religious. I'm impressed. Blown away. I right? I find someone super impressive and religious. And then I ask the question, 
does he have a profession? Does he have a resume? Is he good at anything? Does he have a skill? And when people tell me no, then that person falls in my eyes. Sakata min ayn. Because Dean is Dean did not come to make you one dimensional, <laughs> make you a tunnel vision human being. Like you gotta balance dunya and akhirah. That's what this Dean means. We're not asked to become monks and live in the mountains in the wilderness. You gotta take care of fam, and you get rewarded for it. You know. And that's the difference between like Islam and any other religion. The fact that Islam isn't saying, you know, oh, what is it called? Live your deen and nothing else. Islam is saying, integrate your Islam, your Iman with life. Live yes. your life, but live it in the eyes of Islam. You know, so like when you see in Christianity, how we talked about in class once, um, it was called the, the priests, they'll go and they'll, they'll, you know, drop their desires and go and say, I'm married to God. You know, I'm completely, yes. you know, disregarding the church. my Yes. Yeah. Yes. Allah's not asking you to do that. He's saying, go ahead, do what you want, but do it through, you know, your own faith. And yes. this, this is another point to hit, the fact that um, the ob it's important to know that in Islam, the object itself isn't haram. The yes. object itself is not haram. It is what we do with the object that, Bam. you know. <laughs> hit it. Hit, hit like, on the nail, for example, wine. In wine, I like, and we're going to drink wine in Jannah. What's wrong with wine? It's because when you drink wine here, you're not doing it for any other reason. Just to loosen up, get intoxicated a little. No, just it's, it, it does it. You're not using it for anything to benefit you at yes. all. So Subham. that's why it's bad. Not the Baraka wine itself. Barakallahu feek. Barakallahu feek. Look, uh, you, you said it beautifully. You know, Allah has made so much halal for us so long as we respect the boundaries. Because there are there is out of bound, which is known as makru and haram. You just gotta avoid out of bounds, then there's so much green turf. Halal green turf, you enjoy. You know? Um, on that note, now sister uh, Dora, if making money is so dope, then where does all this rhetoric come from? Where people are like, um, money is fitna, deen over dunya, brother, you know. Um, we're supposed to be minimalist, which, you know, there is truth in that. But where does all that rhetoric come from when Islam is actually encouraging you to make money and calling money khayr? So here are scholars, they say something beautiful. They say making money is fine. Money, like you said, is neutral. And it actually becomes khayr and rewarding. But if money leads to one of three things, it becomes a problem. What are those three things? Number one, if money makes you wasteful. Mm -hmm. If money makes you greedy, and if money makes you conceited, now we have a problem. Those three things need to be avoided. What was the first one? Wasteful, extravagance. Will Smith said it best. If you're trying to understand extravagance and wastefulness, he used to say, wasteful is when you buy the things you don't need with money you don't have to impress the people you don't like. <laughs> it's yes, such an on-point definition. That. Wastefulness is when you buy the things you don't need with money, you don't have to impress the people you don't like. You're being wasteful for no reason. This is someone racking up credit card debt, you know, to buy the next Yeezys and the next Supreme drop. Yo, like, stay within your limit. Why do you have to, why do you have to put yourself in that type of a situation and go beyond and be extra like that? This is where someone's throwing an insane wedding, taking out debt after debt because they're like, yo, but you see your cousin's wedding? Yeah, we gotta. We gotta maintain appearances, you know? Gotta keep up with the Joneses. This is wastefulness. So that's the first thing hopefully money doesn't lead to. Secondly, money should not lead to greed. Greed is when someone is so obsessed with money that they will cross any ethical line and they will break any peop any anyone's right. Any boundary they need to cross, they will. So this is where someone is running a liquor store because they wanna just, you know, the bank balance is all that matters. Yeah, they're running liquor stores and you confront them. And you're like, brother, it's blatantly haram. Like, this is like fear Allah. It and then what do they tell you? I got kids to feed, bills to pay. We're in the land of the Kufar, you know? Dottle help. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But see, what's fueling it is that greed. Money, like, you know, the obsession, the dollar signs in the eyes. Like, this is where um, mega corporations, wallahi, are raping the planet for their bottom line. You know, where you have companies, I don't know if you ever heard of this term called PO, planned obsolescence, where there are companies, and Apple was just fine for this, where they intentionally slow down their products, forcing their customers to buy more. You know, it's just greed, you know? 
where you have companies like Coca-Cola in the 1970s, they paid millions of dollars to finance scientific studies. Why? Because they wanted to change the conversation around what it means to be healthy. And they managed to convince everyone that being healthy is actually about, is actually about how much you exercise, not about what you eat. So for a long time, that was a prevailing narrative. And that's where the gyms and everything started to explode. And now recently, there were, once again, there was a big lawsuit that they had to deal with because of this. And now scientists are coming back. They're like, no, it actually matters. What kind of a diet do you have? You can never outrun a bad diet. So these are examples of greed where people will, ethics don't matter. Especially if you don't believe in God and all, all you have is this life, then like obviously your bottom line is what you worship. So which is why, like, last thing is, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Uh, which is why like intention, intention, intention is so important. The minute you realize that like Allah has blessed me with something, whether it's money, whether it's, you know, food, whether it's anything, whether it's children, you know, anything you have to remember what am, what is my intention as i have these things yes. when i yes when i take care of these children am i taking care of these children because oh i want to look fancy in front of my friends you know look i have all these children to support me i have all these children to take care of me or are you actually taking care of these children because you feel like this is a blessing from allah and i as a muslim i need to be that person to help mm. them to support them that's what we always have to think of our intention every single that's, minute. That's right. And, and I feel like if people keep checking their intention, then I feel like we can avoid the third thing that money should not lead to, and that is conceitedness. Mm -hmm. this, is where, yes. this, is, this is where you constantly feel the need to tell people how rich you are, where you constantly use money to flex your status. This is where you no longer accept invitations from certain members of the community because they're not in your income bracket. They're not your country club, cigar club buddies, you know? So it makes you just such a stuck up, snobbish, annoying, like pompous individual. So as long as money does not lead to those three things, as Ibn Abbas said, as long Ibn Abbas said it beautifully. He just summarized the whole thing for us. He's like, yo, eat what you want, wear what you want, no problem, so long as you avoid two things. Wastefulness and showing off. Wastefulness and conceitedness. You avoid those two things, you're good. It's Gucci. So, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that money becomes khair for us and not sure for us. That we become, we turn money into a, a means of getting closer to Allah and not an obstacle of getting to Allah. Ameen. Ya Rabbal Alameen. Barakallahu feek. Barakallahu feek. So it's a dua. Any last comments before we um, sign off for the day? Okay, so to my woman out there, right? Our listening right here. You need to remember, right, that no matter what, no matter what excuse people say like, oh, no, Islam is all about, you know, the man supporting the woman. It's the woman needs to just, you know, know her place in life. OK, this this is not an Islamic view. Do, the first thing, first thing, remember, Khadija, anha. Khadija was a working woman and she worked just as hard as Rasulullah. Woman working is not an issue. Women working, it's not an Islamic viewpoint. Women, work, women working is, just as uh, Brother Mir just emphasized, it is something to be proud of. Because working, in general, is something good. It's something encouraged. So, just, I have to say, this is spreading some feminism out there. <laughs> I should have known this was coming from you, Dua. I should have known this. <laughs> Barakallah feek. Thank you, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make Look, look I, on that note, though, May Allah reward our sisters because working and managing family is so tough. Because the, the way I see my own wife, the way she feels about taking care of a child, the tenderness she has, the concern and worry. Like, you know, I can, I'm away from Ibrahim right now. I'm in California. I'm okay. Like, like I'm not getting like an anxiety attack. <laughs> she though, if she didn't see him for 24 hours, the world turns upside down, you know? <laughs> so now when you have that kind of a maternal instinct, and you're worried about pleasing the boss, it can like literally, it's like, you know, a splitting headache. You're being pulled apart, ripped apart. So, and this is where we want to make sure we don't put our sister under an undue, un, some ridiculous circumstance. We ask Allah for balance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make things easy for us. Barakallahu yeah. feekum, you guys. Thank you very much. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum.